Back to Black, the biopic of British jazz singer Amy Winehouse features Marisa Abella's uncanny portrayal, but the film has been criticized for sanitizing the true story. Here are some details of Winehouse's life that the movie left out. Back to Black opens with Amy Winehouse in her late teens, at the home of her grandmother where her family is gathered for dinner, wine, cake, and a sing-along. The scene makes it clear that Winehouse's circle of family and friends is large, but what isn't mentioned is her older brother Alex, four years her senior, who taught her to play guitar. Winehouse's parents are at the gathering, but it's revealed that they're divorced and living separately. Back to Black suggests that teenage Winehouse is still upset about the divorce, but in reality, it was finalized when she was nine, and one could logically assume she was used to the idea by the time her career began. The movie also glosses over the fact that her father Mitch later remarried a woman whom he claimed in his memoir, Amy My Daughter, he'd been in love with for many years while still married. The opening scene also depicts Winehouse talking to her beloved grandmother, Cynthia. That kind of beehive glamorization of the 50s, that, that all comes from Cynthia. And During their conversation, Winehouse talks about being expelled from school. According to legend, this happened at Sylvia Young Theater School and was a consequence of her wearing a nose ring. However, the school insists Winehouse simply switched schools when she was offered an opportunity she couldn't turn down. Winehouse's grandmother, Cynthia, was a notable singer on the London jazz scene who happened to be involved with Ronnie Scott, who ran a famous British jazz club. What's missing from Back to Black is that Cynthia was instrumental in turning her granddaughter away from traditional schooling and toward performance. I don't write songs to be famous. I've got to make something good out of something bad. After she attended the Sylvia Young Theatre School, Winehouse won entry to the prestigious Brit School, known for producing some of the UK's greatest stage and screen talent. Multi-platinum selling singer Adele went there, along with X Factor winner Leona Lewis and Spider-Man star Tom Holland. Winehouse recalled her time there with fondness, noting that the fact that the school is tuition-free means talented young people get a chance they wouldn't otherwise have to build a career in entertainment. In an early scene in Back to Black, Winehouse is asleep in bed when her phone rings. She answers with a barrage of curse words, which is awkward because at the other end is her best friend Tyler, on speaker alongside his music manager who loves Winehouse's demo. I wouldn't write anything unless it was directly personal to me, just because I wouldn't be able to tell the story right. Tyler is Tyler James, a noted musician in his own right. But what Back to Black leaves out is how close the two were. James and Winehouse met at school at the age of 12 and became best friends over their shared love of music. In fact, James lived with Winehouse from the age of 18 right up to her death at the age of 27. For obvious reasons, James has been highly critical of the biopic, telling The Sun, they sugarcoated it, glossed over her amazing life, and missed out huge chunks. It is not telling her story. So much more could have been told in this film that would have built up a better and fuller picture of who Amy was. Back to Black has been knocked by some critics and fans for its somewhat sympathetic portrayal of Blake Fielder Civil, the video production assistant she married in 2007 after a whirlwind romance, who was sentenced to prison just months later. Though the film depicts Fielder Civil offering Winehouse cocaine the morning after their first night together, which she declines, Winehouse is later shown getting crack and smoking it alone. I ain't no spy scale. Fielder Civil has taken full responsibility for introducing Winehouse to hard drugs, but there was far more to the story of his legal troubles than Back to Black lets on. In 2006, Fielder Civil was involved in a widely reported fight with James King, manager of London pub The Macbeth, which resulted in King needing surgery to repair a broken cheekbone. Fielder Civil and an accomplice then attempted to bribe the victim with $400,000. Whether the money came from his wife is unclear, but considering Winehouse's net worth, it's not improbable. And although they divorced after two years of marriage, the pair got back together for a time and considered remarrying. Considering Amy Winehouse was one of the biggest names in British pop during her short career, Back to Black is curiously free of other famous faces. Apart from her interview with British chat show host Jonathan Ross and her friendship with Tyler James, it appears from the biopic that she was barely in contact with other celebrities at all. Have they tried to, to mold you in any way that people ask you to do things to change the way you look or speak or behave? Yeah, one of them tried to mold me into a big triangle shape and I went, no! The truth is that Winehouse had several famous friends with whom she would often party in Camden, including Kelly Osbourne and comedian Russell Brand, who knew Winehouse long before she was a household name. Brand wrote warmly of their friendship after her death, describing her as a beautiful, talented woman, and regretting that, as someone recovering from addiction, he had been unable to intervene in hers. She was raw, she was fast with a blue joke, could drink anybody under the table, wasn't afraid to roll the smoke. Another London figure Winehouse knew well was Pete Doherty, the troubled singer of the indie rock band The Libertines. The pair notoriously appeared in a bizarre YouTube video in late 2008, in which they appeared high and in possession of a box of baby mice. In the video, titled Wine Mouse, the pair addressed Blake Fielder Civil, asking him not to divorce her. Years after Winehouse's death, Doherty admitted he and Winehouse had an affair. You got an eye for the bad boys, Amy Winehouse. 
Then there's the film's omission of Winehouse's meeting with her hero Tony Bennett, with whom she recorded a duet in 2011, shortly before her death. I just regretted that I wasn't able to tell her to slow down. And then she died. And back to Black, the people in Winehouse's life admonish her for not taking her epilepsy seriously. In fact, the only treatment she receives in the film comes when she finally goes to rehab. In reality, she was hospitalized on several occasions. In 2007, the singer's U.S. tour was canceled after she was hospitalized due to an overdose. Later that year, she and Fielder Civil went to rehab together, but left within days of checking in. News of further hospitalizations came in 2008, when she had a seizure after an argument with a recently paroled husband. A source close to the singer claimed that the medical intervention was one of many such instances over the years. During the peak years of her fame, Winehouse was constantly pursued by paparazzi looking to score a front-page-worthy shot of the troubled star. This aspect of her life is covered in Back to Black, which includes numerous scenes of Winehouse facing walls of photographers with flashbulbs who managed to capture her at her lowest moments. Thankfully for Winehouse, she devised an escape from the media circus, one that didn't make the film at all. In 2009, when she was under growing pressure from a record label to write a follow-up record to the Grammy award-winning Back to Black, she retreated to a luxury resort on the island of St. Lucia. Originally intended as a vacation following a successful stint at rehab to combat her drug addiction, she remained on the island for eight months. There, she enjoyed the beaches, took up horse riding, and reportedly made the acquaintance of the island's stray dogs. It was around this time that Winehouse set up her own label, Lioness, through which she helped launch the career of her goddaughter and protege Dion Bromfield. However, she struggled to record more songs of her own, with reports claiming that, despite having kicked heroin and cocaine, she was still drinking heavily, and wasn't confident that she could replicate the success of her hit sophomore album. Back to Black paints Winehouse's father Mitch as a loving if somewhat controlling figure in her life, who went out of his way to guide his young daughter in the early stages of her career, and had no qualms telling her what she didn't want to hear. But Mitch is a far more controversial figure than the movie suggests. I think he was a normal cab driver whose daughter then became the most successful female artist in the world. Around the time that Winehouse was sheltering from the press in St. Lucia, the relationship between father and daughter began to grow strained. Mitch was fond of giving interviews to any news outlet that would have him, but as Winehouse's health deteriorated and her addictions grew, Mitch's thirst for publicity didn't slow down. In one notorious incident, Mitch turned up on St. Lucia with a camera crew to make a documentary about his daughter, seemingly against her wishes, and she tried her best to hide from the camera whenever possible. That's my daughter! That's my Amy! The sense that Mitch was intruding on his daughter's recovery was heightened by a post on what was then Twitter when the documentary aired, which read, Why don't my dad write a song when something bothers him instead of going on national TV? You thought your parents were embarrassing. Then, just a year after Winehouse's death, Mitch cashed in with his memoir, Amy, My Daughter. Meanwhile, the 2015 documentary Amy, to which Mitch contributed interviews, contained such a negative account of his relationship with his daughter that he attempted to take legal action against the filmmakers. It's made clear in Back to Black that Winehouse's marriage to Blake Fielder Civil was the most important romantic relationship in her life. The singer even had his name tattooed at the same time as pieces commemorating her father and grandmother. But where Back to Black documents Winehouse's despair at the end of her marriage, it erroneously suggests that their relationship was the last love affair of her life. You're my heartbeat, you're my soul, I love you! The truth is that Winehouse had multiple relationships after her 2009 divorce, two of which were widely reported in the tabloids. The first was with Mick Whitnall, guitarist for the Pete Doherty-fronted indie band Baby Shambles. It was reported that Whitnall taught Winehouse to take cocaine by mixing it with cotton candy. Winehouse also had a serious relationship with a man named Reg Travis. The pair were together for the last two years of her life and were reportedly engaged to be married. Several of Winehouse's most iconic live performances are reproduced in Back to Black, often with uncanny accuracy. However, the film fails to mention that throughout Winehouse's career, her addictions began to impact her to the point where her shows left her fans dissatisfied and frustrated. On occasion, she was unable to perform at all. Even on St. Lucia, reports emerged of a shambolic festival performance in which she cursed at the audience and left the stage after four songs. But worse was to come, as Winehouse's health declined once again after her return to London to resume her career. Sure, there were some acclaimed performances during that time, including at London's prestigious 100 Club. But in June 2011, footage emerged of an obviously inebriated Winehouse on stage in Serbia, slurring her words and unable to perform, being booed by the crowd. It was someone who just really didn't care anymore. That would be Winehouse's last stage appearance before her tragic death a month later. At the end of Back to Black, Winehouse climbs the stairs of her London home toward what we know to be her tragic death at the age of 27, news of which would send shockwaves around the world. An epilogue displayed on a black screen tells a viewer she died of alcohol poisoning. The 
film makes it clear that Winehouse had been sober for an extended period before the episode that killed her. According to her stepmother, Jane, who spoke to The Independent on the 10th anniversary of Winehouse's death, the singer had achieved longer and longer periods of sobriety before relapsing. She shared, We thought she was going to pull through. We thought she was going to beat it. But the truth is that as periods of sobriety lengthen, a person's tolerance for alcohol becomes gradually lower. This makes a relapse especially dangerous, especially if the person resumes drinking at the level they were used to at the height of their addiction. In the wake of Winehouse's death, health practitioners urged greater awareness of the tolerance effect, which could save the lives of people with addiction issues in the future. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.